Welcome back, everyone. So today we're going to pretty much wrap up our discussion of trees for the, mo for the moment. We'll talk about, uh, we'll finish talking about binary search trees, which we started discussing last time. Uh, we'll do another problem. And then we're going to shift gears a little bit. So we'll remind ourselves that recursion is a technique that we can use on a variety of different types of data structures, not just trees. Then we'll introduce you to sorting, which is a fantastic problem that we are going to spend a couple of lectures talking about over the next week. And then at the very end, I'll explain how to get a job. So this will be a fun, a fun morning. Okay. So let's go back to our uh, recursive tree search problem. So last time we implemented tree search, or we discussed how to do it. I think I left this to you because it's going to be a homework problem this week. But we talked about how to search on a tree, on a general tree, a general case of our binary tree. As usual, we want to break this down into a couple of different pieces. Whenever we talk about recursive algorithms, we're going to think about what the base case is. So the base case with our um, recursive tree search was either we get to a leaf node, because at that point I can't make the problem smaller anymore, or I find the node I'm looking for. And I have still embarrassingly forgot to update this slide, but I will get to it at some point. So when we're looking for something in a tree, if I find a node that has the value I'm looking for, I don't have to look for the rest of the tree. If I'm trying to count how many times that value appears, then I do have to look through the rest of the tree. But if I'm just returning a Boolean that says, does the tree contain a particular value, I can stop as soon as I find it. So I stop either when I get to a leaf node or when I find the value I'm looking for. The way that I make the problem smaller, my recursive step, is that I look for the value in both my subtrees. So if the node that I'm at doesn't have the value, if it has the value, I'm done because I can just return true and, and finish the job right there. But if the, that node doesn't contain the value, then essentially I want to say, is it in my right subtree? And I'll look there. Is it in my left subtree? I can look there as well. And I'm going to exploit this similarity um, that trees have because trees are a recursive data structure, meaning that every subtree of a tree is also a tree. And so I can restart the same algorithm that I'm using. This is why a recursive implementation will tend to call itself. I can restart the process on my right subtree, look at the result, and I can restart the process on my left subtree. If either one of those subtrees contains the value, then I'm done. I found it. Um, otherwise, I return false. So how do I combine the results? I say, if I have the value, then return true immediately. Otherwise, I take the logical or of whether or not the value exists in my right subtree or in my left subtree. And the fun thing is that if I find the value in my right subtree, and that's the one I look at first, I can stop. I can finish the job right there. Okay. So we're not going to implement this again. Um, but what I, what we, where we sort of stopped last time was uh, talking about how to make this more efficient. Trees in computer science are a huge and extremely interesting family of data structures. So again, when you get to 225, you'll talk about uh, trees used in a variety of other contexts. Um, trees are your ubiquitous data structure, but how I structure the tree internally has a lot to do with its usefulness for doing certain types of operations. So up until this point, the only structure that we've imposed on our tree is that every node has two children. That makes it a binary tree. A tree doesn't have to be binary. There are trees that are in wide use where nodes can have any number of children, but we've been talking about binary trees. But we pointed out last time, who can remember this? So I would like to be able to search the tree a little bit more efficiently. So if I look at the algorithm described here, there's a place where I can optimize if I can make some changes to the tree structure. And to jog your memory, that place is that here I have to look in both my right and my left subtree, down here. So if I contain the value, it's easy. But if I don't contain the value, then I have to look both in my right subtree and in my left subtree. Because up until this point, we've had no rules about where things go in the tree. I can just put them anywhere. I can add a node anywhere in a binary tree as long as its parent doesn't already have two children. But if I impose a little bit of extra structure on the tree, it turns out that I can improve the performance of this algorithm. And the way I can do that is at this step right here. So what I would like to be able to do 
is to know whether or not I should look in my right subtree or my left subtree. So if I knew that when I got here, I could say, okay, well, I don't contain the value, but is it in my right subtree? It should be in my right subtree, so I'm only gonna look in my right subtree, or it should be in my left subtree, I'm only gonna look in my left subtree. And so doing this creates something that's known as a binary search tree. So we started out with trees, which were this really general data structure, then we made them binary. Every node can only have two children. Now we're making them a binary search tree. So this is a additional sort of sub variant of a binary tree. And we pointed out that there's some differences. So I'm gonna show you the code. We're not gonna talk about this at length. We will implement search, but um, there's some differences here. So instead of storing objects in my node, I'm now storing objects that implement the comparable interface. Remember way back when we talked about interfaces, I promised you that this simple decision to allow two objects in Java to be put in order has profound consequences, particularly when we talk about data structures. I promised that we would be able to search for things more efficiently, and now here we are talking about it, so that's kind of fun. The fact that I can put things in order is, in, is necessary for this. I cannot implement a binary search tree on an arbitrary Java object. I have to be able to make a consistent choice given two objects about which one goes first and which one goes second, and we'll see that in use here. So my nodes are now storing object, any object in Java that stores comparable, that implements comparable. So all Java numbers implement comparable, like integers and doubles and things like that. Strings implement comparable. Your new classes can also implement comparable if you want. And if you do that, and there's a natural way to compare them, you can now put them into this binary search tree and search for them efficiently. All right, so the other thing that was different, if you scroll down a little bit and look at the add method, so previously I had an add method that essentially said, okay, if the node doesn't have a right or left child, I'll add it to that node. But if it has both, I'll pick a right or left subtree at random, and that's where I'll put the node. Now I have to be more precise about where I put things because I'm gonna use this feature when I look for things. So, I'm imposing additional structure on my tree. Before when I had a binary tree, the only rule was every node can only have two children. Now, there's, the rule is different. The rule is that when I'm inserting a value into the tree, if uh, the value is greater than the uh, node, the value at that node, then I either, I need to add it to the right side. And I can do that in two ways. I can either add it as the right child of that node if the node doesn't have a right child. If the node already has a right child, I'm gonna add it to the right subtree, okay? Otherwise, I'm gonna add it to the left subtree, and this is arbitrary. All I need to be able to do here is to compare things consistently. So I'm using compare to, and again, this is a place where this idea of being able to put objects in order becomes incredibly important. So if the object is bigger than the current node, it goes to the right, either as the right child or in the right subtree. If it's smaller or equal to, it goes to the left, and I could flip those around. And maybe I did flip them around. I'm not exactly sure what this does. I, can, I, I always forget how compare to works. I have to look it up, but anyway. But the idea is here is I'm being consistent. I'm always gonna put things in a particular spot in the tree. I'm not just adding them in a random location. All right, so this is something that I can now use when I implement search, okay? So let's, let's, let's recall our original search algorithm, okay? So originally what I did when I was looking for things, and now search is gonna have to take a comparable as well, um, so I need to, to, to modify the signature. So my, initial, my original search algorithm was, I'm gonna do my usual optimization. Oh, I have to call my function, so I'm gonna return search I'm gonna start the search at the root node, and now I'm gonna implement my wrapped function search that takes two, um, two arguments, a node where I'm currently at in the tree, and the value that I'm looking for. And so now I can go back to my description, and I'm just gonna implement this, this original search algorithm. So I'm gonna let myself walk off the tree the way I usually do. So I'm gonna say if current is equal to null, return false. This means that I've 
walked off the tree, it makes the rest of the code a little bit simpler because I don't have to worry about whether or not my right or left child are null. All right, so that's part of my base case, but the more important part of my base case is I'm gonna say if current.value dot equals value, then I found the value, and I'm done. I do not have to look at my right or left subtree here. I'm finished, this is part of my base case. All right? Otherwise, here's what I did originally. What I did originally was I said, return search current.left value or search current.right value. If I have the value, I'm done. Otherwise, I look in my right subtree, and then I also look in my left subtree. This will still work, right? So let's make sure it still works. So I'm looking for a value that's in the tree. Okay, that's good. I'm looking for a value that's not in the tree. Okay, it's false. So this seems to work. But I can do better than this. I added structure to the tree for a reason. I've got comparables instead of objects for a reason. So what do I do differently here? in my search algorithm. I'm building the tree differently and I'm building the tree differently precisely so that I can do the search differently. How do I take advantage of that additional structure that I've added to the tree when looking for stuff? That's why I did it in the first place. Who can help me out here? This search algorithm is fine, but it is not good enough. We can do better. What's an idea about how to do this? Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna do that. Okay, so, so the suggestion is, hey, maybe I can compare the value that I'm looking for to the current node's value. Okay, and then what? What do I do with that information? Yeah. Yeah. So when I built the tree, I had a rule about where to put stuff, and I applied the rule. And so when I'm looking for stuff, if I don't have the value, I know, depending on how it compares with me, whether or not it should be in my right child tree or my left tree. So I shouldn't have to look for both trees anymore. I know where the value should be. I say, okay, I'm not the value, but because of how I built the tree, it's Depending on how it compares with me, it's either going to be in my right subtree or my left subtree. All right, so let's, let's try to do this. So I'm going to say if current.value compare to value. And again, these are comparable, so I can do this, all right? Um, if that's, uh, I've got to remind myself how I did add here. If that's greater than or equal to zero, else I'm going to put this down here. Okay. So let's go back and look at how I built the tree. So when I was putting a new value in, if the value was greater than or equal to to the value at that node, I put it on what, in what part of the tree? If it's greater than or equal, I put it to my right. My right, your left. Your left, my, your right, my left, right? If it's, if otherwise, I put it in my left subtree. So here, what I should be able to do is All right, cool. Let's see if this works. Hopefully it works, otherwise we might have to move some things around. Okay, so that's still false. Let's look for something that is in the tree. That's true. Let's look for four. That seems to work. Let's add some more nodes here. Let's make this tree a little bit more interesting. So I'm gonna put a negative value in here, and I'll put zero in here again, and I just wanna make sure that these still work. Let's look for that negative value. Um, let's look for a negative value that doesn't exist. Okay. So, it's a small change, but what's good about this? We're gonna come back and talk about this again when we start talking more about sorting algorithms, but what did I just do? This is a small change, but it's a powerful change. Binary search trees are a real thing. People use them to solve real problems. Why? What 
What is better about this? David. Uh, they're more efficient. It's more efficient, exactly. So before, if I didn't find something in my right subtree, I looked in my left subtree. I don't do that anymore. Now I know where the value should be, so if it's not in my right subtree, I don't even bother looking in the left. It can't be in the left subtree because of how I added the values. Same thing if I'm looking at my left subtree. It can't be in the right subtree. It's impossible because of how I built the tree. So the, the, the uh, performance of this just got a lot better. And it got a lot better in some other cases too. So let's say I'm looking for a value that's not in the tree. Right? So if I, if I go back to my old search algorithm, when I look for a value that's not in the tree, I'm going to tend to have to look at every single node. And if you want to convince yourself of this, go through, restore the original search algorithm, put a counter in there so you can figure out how many times the search runs. It will visit every node. It has no idea where the thing it's looking for could be, and so it has to go to every single node in the tree looking for everything until it doesn't find it and then it gives up. My binary search tree doesn't have to do that because it knows where the node should be. And so if you compare the two, what you'll find is even when I'm doing an unsuccessful search, my binary search tree will search far fewer nodes. Now there's some issues with this in terms of how the tree structure gets built. One of the main things you guys will learn in 225 is how to maintain a particular property of this tree so that the search stays efficient over time as I add or remove nodes from it. Okay, and I'm not going to talk about that because that's, that's for later. But this is better. Right? We've made an improvement here. We've, and, and this is, you know, I think a great example of how I, of, how, of why we structure data. Right? So I made a small change to how the tree is built that produces a small change to how I look for things that potentially produces a massive change in how fast it is to search the tree. So just to give you a comparison, remember those different you know, curves we looked at? If I look in a binary tree for a value with no structure, search is O-N in the worst case. I have to look for every node. If I look in a binary search tree for a node, search is O log N in the best case. And so I have moved myself from something that goes up to the right to something that grows much more slowly. So this is kind of a, this is kind of a big deal. Okay. Questions about that before we go on? We're gonna do another, another example here that's going to give us a chance to do some review of lists and remind ourselves of how to do that. Okay, so let's, so this is, you guys are gonna do problems like this all week. This is the week of tree homework problems in 125. Um, one thing we're gonna do as we go on is we're gonna start asking you to use other data structures as part of your tree implementations, as part of your tree solutions. So some count, those are too easy for this part of the week. It's Wednesday, right? We gotta do some more complicated stuff, some more interesting things. And this also gives you a great chance to practice using some built-in data structures in Java. All right, so here's what I wanna do. Given a tree, this is sometimes called flattening the tree. I wanna take a tree that's got all this structure to it, and I, what I want when I'm done is a single list that contains all the values in the tree. If the value appears multiple times in the tree, it should appear multiple times in the list. So essentially, I want to convert one type of data structure. I've got this hierarchical data structure called a tree that has data in it, and I want to flatten it. You know, you can think of a tree as like, I'm flattening it into a list, but I want to flatten it in such a way so that the list contains every item in the tree. Okay, so let's talk through how to do this. What's my base case here? When do I stop? When I reach a leaf node or when I walk off the end of the tree, yeah. So I've reached a, let's, let's say when I reach a null node, right? So if I reach a node that's null, it means I walked off the side of the tree and there's nothing to add to the list at that point. I've essentially reached an empty tree and I don't have anything to put on the list. What's my recursive step? This is not that different from every other way that we approach these types of problems. It's a binary tree. How do I make the problem smaller? Let's say I want a list of all the nodes in a particular tree and that node has some children. What are the subproblems I'm gonna solve? Yeah. Right subtree, left subtree, yeah. Consider our right subtree and left subtree separately. This is our canonical approach to dealing with these. So here's an interesting question. So how are we combining results here? I mean, what we want is a list. 
And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna actually pass a reference to the list to each, um, you know, instantiation of the algorithm, and I'm gonna put myself on it. So I'm essentially gonna say, okay, I need to be on the list, so I'm gonna add myself, and then I'm gonna restart the algorithm on my right subtree and my left subtree, so all the nodes in my right subtree have a chance to add themselves, and all the nodes in my left subtree have a chance to add themselves. So on some of the homework problems this week, and on the lab that you guys are working on, and on MP4, we're giving you some practice with working with uh, Java lists. So we've talked about lists, you guys have implemented some of your own lists, now we're gonna use the built-in Java list classes, which, you know, again, lists are one of these data structures that you meet in heaven. They're so fantastic, okay? At this point, here's my suggestion. Some people will, will get mad at me for this. Stop using arrays. Just stop. They're usually not the right solution to a problem. Use a list. Way more flexible. Um, you know, you can add things, you can insert things. You can solve problems using arrays. Don't get me wrong. But usually, if the goal is to solve a problem, using a list is gonna get you there faster. It's just a lot more flexible. So in Java, there are two built-in uh, implementations. So list in Java is an interface. It's a contract that a number of different uh, implementations can provide. There are two built-in uh, list implementations in Java that you might wanna get familiar with. Well, you need to get familiar with for MP4 and, and for lab today and for some of the homework problems. One of the ones that people use a lot is something called an array list. As its name implies, an array list is a list where the items are stored internally in an array. So the uh, performance of the array list for various operations is not that different from what we've talked about. You guys already implemented this. You know how this works internally, or a little bit about how it works. Now the Java implementation for real is probably a lot more complicated, more optimized, and play some tricks to try to improve performance here and there but it's basically what you guys already did on the homework. You've implemented an array list, so you know how it works. But don't use it, your implementation, use the one that's built into Java that millions of people use every day. We know that it works, okay? There are no, there are, I would be shocked if there are bugs in this, right? Um, there's also a linked list class that you can, you can use as well. Again, works how it sounds. You guys have built one of these as well, internally stores the items in a linked list, has some of the performance characterization, uh, characteristics of the linked list that you guys have implemented. But again, we're done implementing these, you're done working on them yourselves, now let's start as a user of how to, how to use these because they're, they're tremendously useful. The, the official Java list interface is this big, gnarly, complicated thing. There are not very many methods that you're going to use in practice, but if you need it as a reference, it's there and you can go through and figure out uh, what it means. There are some features of this that you're not gonna understand yet. This is one of the things I hate about Java. Um, this stuff, for example, we're gonna get there. You will understand this in a couple of weeks, but for now, when you see those brackets with an E inside them, just sort of like ignore it, um, squint at it. Um, and when you, when for example, you look at things like the, no, 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 where'd it go? The, the, like a, there's so much stuff in here. Where's the get method? Did I miss it? Yeah, I can't, there it is. So you look at get, right? So get takes an index and it returns E, it's just a reference to an item that's in the list. Again, we will get there and we will talk about this and why this is set up this way, but it doesn't make sense yet. I haven't explained this for a reason. Uh, I will explain it later uh, at what I consider to be an appropriate time. But we can use these already, and we're going to in two seconds. So this is the way that you, know, you would import the, the packages you need. My suggestion is to do the following. Whenever you're using a list, have your reference type be a list, not an array list. There are reasons for this. It doesn't really matter one way or another, but you know, here's how I would suggest you always instantiate a list. This creates a new array list, so this is the implementation of the list, and then as we know, I can upcast to a list interface type, and then I can use it as if it's a list. The reason for this is simply because it becomes much easier later if you do this to swap out for other types of lists if you decide that you need to. Okay, so let's do our problem. So I've implemented up here the list and the array list interface, and we have a function here called all values. All values is gonna return a reference to a list that contains all the values in the node, in the tree. All right, so like I normally do, I'm going to create a, uh, a private method that all values is gonna call. That's going to take both the node that I'm working on and 
a list um, called these values, okay? So really what I'm gonna do as usual is just return, start this on the root, but I also need to create a list for it to use. Um, and here I can just do this as part of the call. So I'll say new array list. This gives me a new list of elements that is initially empty. So on the right side, I create my new array list, and I'm gonna upcast that to a list reference, and then I'm gonna call my all values method. So let's go back to our algorithm here. So my base case is I've got, is I've reached a null node. So I'm gonna say if current is equal to null, then return values. So if I've walked out the edge of the tree, I should stop. Otherwise, what do I need to do? It's two th there's like two things. One is kind of restart things, the recursive step, but what, what's important here to do to make sure that the values that is returned is correct? Who could describe what I need to do here to me in English? Before I restart things, yeah. Yeah, and what I really want is a list of values, so I need to add current.value, exactly. So I need to make sure that the value at this node is on the list. So I'm gonna say values.add, current.value. That's it, it's really easy. By default, that'll put things at the end of the list. If you want to put them somewhere else, you could provide an index, but here I didn't provide any rules about where things are in the list, so this is fine. All right, so what's my recursive step here? What do I do? How do, I make the, how do I make the problem smaller? So I'm on the list now, right? But who else needs to be on the list before I'm finished? Somebody who hasn't spoken up yet today. I know you guys know the answer to this. You're so, so, so shy. Yeah, so the list I, I, I have is values, right? Yeah, so, so there's, there's a, I could try to add everything in my right subtree and add everything in my left subtree, but my recursive step is adding the current node. So this gets a little bit tricky here, right? Um, what's, let's just try this. Let's try, try calling all values with current.write and values. So what's this going to do? This is going to call, restart the, uh, the algorithm on my right subtree. That node is going to add itself if it exists, and then it's going to restart on the right subtree. And so as I'm going, this, this, this values list is going to continue to be updated. And I can do this on my left subtree as well. Values, and then I can return values here. This is a way to do this, and it seems to work. One thing here that's a little interesting is that um, I don't really need to return a value. So I, I can write this in a slightly different way. Let's do this. Um, so essentially, I can just do, I can have my wrapper function say list values is equal to new array list. I can call it, and then I can return values here. And then here, this doesn't need to return anything. This, uh oh, oh, I have to, yeah, I have to actually use this that I've created. There we go. So yeah, so this is a little bit of a different way of doing it. So my wrapper function creates the list. It then starts the recursion using the list. As the recursion is going on, it's passing that reference around to all the new copies of add values that run. Every one of them adds itself, then it restarts on the right and left subtree, and then I'm done. As I go, that list is being modified by every copy of uh, the function, but I don't need my internal function to really return anything. The way that I'm returning a result is by modifying that list. So here's another way to do this. Questions about this? This is something you guys are gonna see a few times this week. Combination of using a, and on MP4, combination of using a tree, but then also using a list internally. Starting to get comfortable 
with the list, the built-in Java list data structure. Mainly because, like I said, this is a tremendously useful data structure that you will need when you work on your final project, that you will need in the future, in your life, if you want to build real things with Java. Um, again, don't, if you're, like, if you have ordered data in Java, the usual thing you reach for is a list, not an array. Questions about this? Okay. See how I'm doing on time. All right, so, goodbye trees. We're done with trees. You guys aren't done with trees. You'll see trees on next week's quiz. We have some more problems on trees, but we're done with trees. Now we're gonna move on. We're gonna start talking about an algorithm and some data structures we've used to solve it for the next uh, week or so. Um, but I wanted to point out something before we go on, which is the trees, and I, I said this at the end of class last time, but trees are not the only data structure that has this recursive property. There are other data structures that I can plug into this sentence. So trees work, but last time we also realized that a list is a recursive data structure. If I take a list and I break it into two pieces, both parts are a list. That's kind of interesting. Um, if I take an array, again, if I snap an array into two pieces, I've got two smaller arrays. And so this gives me a clue that I might be able to write recursive algorithms that run on lists and arrays, and it turns out that indeed we can and we will. So let me show you, and this, this is a, uh, so in, in a list, right, so the question is how do, I break the, how do I break the problem down and make it smaller, right? So as I go through a list, at any point I can consider the item that I'm at and then the rest of the list. So I'm at this particular, I'm at item six, how do I make the problem smaller? I consider this, this item and the rest of the list. And then I keep going. So now I'm at item five. How do I consider how I'm gonna make the problem smaller? I think about this item and the rest of the list. I'm at item eight. How do I make the problem smaller? I think about this item and the rest of the list until I get to the end. Eventually I get to an element in the list that doesn't have a next reference. And I've reached the end of the list. And so you can write We've, we've shown you how to iterate on lists, mainly because I think that's more useful. But you can write a sum over a list as a recursive function. You can write a recursive function that counts the number of nodes in a list. Like, you can write all of these uh, functions using recursion on lists if you want to. It's another way to solve the problem. So, okay, I meant, you know, how do we make the problem smaller? We basically look at the current item and the rest of the list. The smallest subproblem is a list with a single element or a null list. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Where I am. Oh, this is, I don't know if I want to do this problem or not. This is a fun problem, but uh, this, is, this is sort of a mind bender. Let, let, let's come back to this. Let me see how I do on time, and then we'll come back to this. This is not something that, that you really need to know. This is just sort of designed to be a fun example of how to use recursion on lists, right? So let me, let me skip it, and then if we have a little bit of time, um, we'll come back and do it. All right, but I also want to show you how we can recurse on arrays, because this is something we are actually going to do over the next week or so when we talk about sorting. So if I take an array, I can identify the fact that each contiguous part of an array is itself an array. So I start off with this array with eight elements. Remember when I did right and left subtree? It starts to look kind of similar. So I have left and right subarray. So now I've got two smaller arrays, each of which has, item four, has size four. I could break them in to different pieces in different ways. I could look at the left one with size two and the right one with size six, but a lot of times we do this evenly for reasons that we'll talk about later. Now I break the left subarray into two parts. I've got a left subarray and a right subarray, and I can keep doing this until I get to an array with a single element. So just like a tree where I broke it down into right subtree and left subtree until I got to a tree with one node, with an array I can split it into smaller and smaller pieces until I get to an array with a single element. And then I can start, I can do this, I can, I can sort of build solutions up this way. Now I'm on the right subarray, looking at the left subarray, right subarray of that, I continue to do this. So just, again, just like with trees and with lists, I need a way to make the problem smaller and identify the smallest subproblem. So how do I make the problem smaller with arrays? I look at the two smaller arrays. And again, whenever we can, we can't always do this. We're gonna see two sorting algorithms that have a recursive uh, structure to them. One of them 
can break the array into pieces very evenly, and the other can't all the time. And because of that, they have different performance characteristics, which we'll talk about later. But whenever I can, I wanna try to break the problem into smaller pieces that are roughly the same size. But any smaller pieces will do. The smallest subproblem on array is an array with a single element, or an array with zero elements. Um, so, those, so those are, you know, this is how our approach maps down to these other data structures. So again, I, I, I don't want to give you the impression with this slide, although I will take questions about recursion now, that we're done with recursion, we're not. We're gonna keep using it as a tool to solve some other problems, particularly once we start talking about sorting. But any general questions about recursion, particularly on trees at this point? This is not something that comes naturally to a lot of people. We keep practicing, yeah. Uh, so as long as it eventually, as long as I hit a base case, right? So you can think about it, when I, start a, when I start a recursive function on a tree, it starts on the root. And then let's say it starts on the right subtree. So the root function is waiting for the right function to finish. And then that function is gonna wait for some other function, right? As long as one of them eventually returns, right? And then the next one returns and the next one returns, that top one will finish. Right. You can think about, you know, again, you can kind of think about where you are in the sequence of, of recursive calls. Um, it's really not that different from calling any other function. Whenever I call a function, the function that's running waits for that function to complete before it continues. With recursion, what's tricky is making sure that I get to a base case. If I don't, then it's possible that I keep recursing and recursing and recursing and I never, I never finish. So the real trick with recursive functions is having a base case and making sure that you are approaching the base case. So that's the other thing. So we've looked at cases with recursion on trees where, for example, if instead of restarting on my right subtray, I restart on myself, I'm not getting closer to the base case because I haven't made the problem small, right? I'm just, now I am in a loop. Right? Good question. Other questions about recursion? Something to wrap your mind around, again, with, with lots of practice. This is not the last time you guys will see it. You'll see it in 173 from a theoretical perspective where it's incredibly useful for proving things, which is really neat. And then you'll see it again in 225 and in later courses, right? This is a powerful idea in computer science. There are languages you guys will learn in the future that are heavily based on recursive solutions to problems, right? Java is a language that on some level is sort of iterative first, but you're gonna learn other languages in the future that on some level are recursive first. They encourage you to build recursive solutions and they make them even easier than Java does, right? So again, Java as a language tends to favor, I would argue, iterative approaches over recursive approaches, but there are other languages that do the reverse. There's other languages where you, there's languages where you can basically not even write a for loop and yet you can still solve a really cool problem. So, so this is something you guys will see. Again, you'll get more comfortable with over time and depending on the context in which it's being used. Okay, so let me introduce for the next 10 minutes the topic for the next week. So we're gonna start talking about sorting. And you might, I, I, one of, the thing I wanna try to do over the next, you know, five, 10 minutes is make you excited about this topic, okay? Um, I know it doesn't sound very interesting, eh, I'm sorting stuff, right? But it turns out that sorting is a building block for a lot of what happens in modern computing, okay? Sorting also brings together a lot of the stuff we've talked about. We're gonna talk about imperative solutions to sorting. We're gonna talk about the runtime analysis of the sorting algorithms that we implement, both in terms of space and in terms of time. We're gonna talk about recursive ways to uh, sort things, right? Um, and so this is a neat kind of place where a lot of the material that we've talked about this semester is starting to come together, which is kind of fun. Sorting, again, also matters in the sense that it is the building block for lots of other algorithms. It turns out if data is sorted, then a lot of things become much easier to do. And so there's a lot of places, whether it's in a database or in Google's data centers or wherever, where data is maintained in a sorted way in order to enable other things to work, right? So sorting, you know, just putting things in a particular order doesn't necessarily uh, it doesn't necessarily seem very meaningful at first, but it turns out to be, again, required and the foundation for a lot of other things. Um, so again, I can search more efficiently if the data is sorted first. I can detect duplicates by sorting data and looking for them that way. That's much more efficient. Um, you know, when I'm, when I'm presenting, a lot of times you guys like to see things in a sorted way, 
right? So sorting all of the lab sections for this class by date and time, for example, right? Um, a lot of times when you guys are looking at information, whether it's sorting all the songs in your playlist by, you know, the, the song title or by the song album or by the song uh, author and artist, right? So to try to convince you of this, there is a, um, there's this challenge every year. I think this is cool. You guys can check this out on your own. Um, if you Google sort benchmark, you'll find this. And this is still going on, right? So sorting is not a solved problem by any means. There's a competition every year that's held um, for, uh, you know, algorithms and systems, actually, not just algorithms, but systems that can sort an enormous amount of data. So this is called the sort challenge. It was initially uh, organized by a famous computer scientist called Jim Gray, who I'll say a few words about in a minute. Um, there's a bunch of different categories. This is sort of like the Olympics of sorting, so like different events, right? There's a category for sorting big data sets really quickly. And then there's a category for sorting big data sets while consuming not very much energy. And then there's a category for you know, sorting big data sets in the most efficient way per dollar. Right? They look at the entire system you built and count up how much everything costs and say, okay, you can, you can sort a trillion records in a second, but your system costs a billion dollars, so no one's going to buy it. Right? And so my, my goal here is to convince you that people are still working on this problem and care very deeply about it. Sorting a, and, and a lot of this is focused on sorting lots and lots and lots of data. Right? If you think about the kind of data that Google has or, or Facebook or whatever, the volumes of that data, being able to sort it um, is really important. So Jim, Jim Gray was, as far as I understand, someone who was involved in um, the, the initial setup of the sorting challenge. And I can't talk about Jim Gray with mentioning the fact that um, Jim Gray vanished at sea um, in 2007. You can't see this is off the end of the slide, which is my fault. But uh, Jim Gray was a brilliant computer scientist. He was a Turing Award winner, which is the Nobel Prize in computer science. Um, he made many seminal con you know, contributions to the field of database systems and, and information. Um, and he went out sailing one day and, and no one ever saw him again. And there was actually a big worldwide effort, a big search project carried out by a lot of volunteers to try to find, you know, uh, look through satellite imagery and look for his boat and stuff like that. But, but he was never found. So, so anyway, but his memory lives on in, in not only his contributions to the field, but in this particular competition that's still going on. All right. So there's a gazillion ways to sort things. We are not going to talk about all of them because we don't have enough time. And at some point, you know, we sort of it, it becomes sufficient. Um, but you know, we'll start talking about sorting on Friday. We'll look at a specific sorting algorithm called insertion sort. That's a an iterative sorting algorithm. Um, you guys will see something called selection sort in lab next week, where we're also going to talk about sorting and searching. Uh, we'll do merge sort in lecture. There's a, something called heap sort that you can find information on online. There's something called quick sort that we'll also cover in lecture. Uh, we'll do bubble sort in lab. And, and again, if, if, if I, um, just to try to convince you to get excited about this, so there's this new sorting algorithm, and new as in like, you know, 17 years old now, right? But that's pretty new, given that computer science has been around for a long time. People have been trying to sort things for a long time. Um, this sorting algorithm is, is called Tim sort. Does anyone want to guess why it's called Tim sort? You know, quick sort is like, oh, I sorted the stuff quickly. That's a good name. Merge sort, you guys will understand uh, why merge sort is called merge sort. Bubble sort, selection sort. Why is it called Tim sort? Yeah. Yeah, guy's name's Tim, right? Tim came up with Tim sort, right? Tim sort turns out to be the standard sorting implementation in both Python and Java at this point, right? So if you want to get famous, um, come up with a better way to sort than Tim sort. And the next sorting algorithm that we talk about, you know, in a couple years could be Heather's sort or, you know, uh, Frank's sort or whatever. Anyway, when you come up with the algorithm, you get to name it, I guess. And he decided to name it Tim sort. That's what it is. Okay, so let me establish some guidelines uh, for how we're going to talk about sorting. Um, we're going to basically to discuss sorting on arrays. Obviously, I can sort a list, I can sort other data structures, but we're going to talk about it on arrays. Um, we're typically going to talk about sorting in ascending order. That's just a convention. We could talk about descending order, too. It doesn't really matter. Um, and we can, can sort anything that we can compare. So again, by implementing comparable in Java, you make your class sortable. But typically, for simplicity, we're going to be talking about sorting integers. All right. I, I'm going to, so when we talk about sorting algorithms, there's really two things that we're going to concern ourselves with. 
both how long do they take, and then also how much space do they take, because this turns out to vary quite a bit between sorting algorithms. Up until this point, we've primarily focused on ON analysis and just time, but if I've got a billion pieces of data, it actually matters how much memory it takes to sort that and whether or not my sorting algorithm needs it, because lots and lots and lots of memory. And so we will talk about the, the space complexity, how much memory or you know, uh, space on the computer is required to implement this. Okay, so I've got five minutes, and I wanna talk about the project fair, which I'm excited about. So um, we are gonna hold our third project fair for this class. Um, it's always bigger, well, it's not bigger this semester, it's smaller than last semester, but better, uh, I, I would hope. Um, here's how we do this. So we're gonna have the fair itself on reading day. Reading day is Thursday, May 2nd. I wanna remind you of something. There is no final exam for this class, all right? So essentially, the fair is really the last thing that we do together as a class. By that point, you'll have done it before, you'll have finished your last midterm, which we'll give in the CBTF the weekend before, so this is really it. Part of the reason that we got rid of the exam, well, there's a lot of reasons, but one of the things that made me happy about it is that I really like doing this together as the last thing we do, because we get to get, see the really cool stuff that you guys build. All right? This is optional. It's on reading day. It's not required. If you come, you get 1% extra credit. Um, oh, and the other thing we're gonna do slightly differently this year is that uh, we'll do the award ceremony where we'll, you know, um, honor the winners, we'll honor some of the course staff, kind of our, our last chance to hang out together on Friday at 1.30, that is our exam slot, right? So all of you should be available during that time. It won't take three hours, it'll probably take half an hour, right? So we'll do the fair on Thursday from one to three, and then on Friday we'll gather here, um, I think, or maybe in Follinger, I can't remember, um, at 1.30, and we'll ju I'll just make some announcements, basically, and then we'll be done, all right? Um, I think this is gonna be in Siebel, we're not quite certain on the, the location yet, but you guys will know in a month when we do it. Let me tell you why this is important. How much time do I have? Two minutes, awesome, okay. So here's a way to get a job in tech, all right? Take classes, do stuff in them, and get good grades. That'll work. It is not hard to find a job in technology right now, and you guys are all going to be really qualified once you're done here. This is one algorithm. This algorithm tends to get you a job, but it tends not to get you a great job. What gives you a good job, you know? Um, but again, if you are too focused on your grades, instead of doing cool stuff, you, like I said, you will get a job. I guarantee that. But it won't be a great job. It'll just be a good job. Still a good job, but not a great job. All right, if you want a great job, what do you actually have to do? You have to show an employer that you are excited about technology. That excitement spills out of the classes you take. It, it gets demonstrated in the fact that you've done stuff that you, know, you, you learned a little bit about it in the class and then you went off and you found a bunch of other information about it online and you used that to do something cool. So the project fair is largely intended to get you guys started with something like that. We're not, this is completely open-ended. You guys get to decide what you do for the project. Some of you are gonna do the minimum, that's okay. Right? You know, every year, like the first year we did this, like 20% of the class built a weather app. Okay, fine. Like, that's cool. That's a good learning experience, right? Um, but I doubt that your weather app is going to, like, shoot up the ranks of the app store. Um, although, to be honest, there's some pretty shitty weather apps out there, right? Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, I've got, a, I've got like, two on my phone, and I don't like either of them. So maybe, maybe there's space for the next great weather app. But, you know, so let me inspire you a little bit more by showing you, this is up on the website, um, some of the things that people built last year. So uh, one of the winning groups built this capture, uh, like a capture the tag game that used RFID tags that you can play around campus. Like that was just like mind-blowingly cool. Um, there's YouTube videos about all these, you guys can go check them out. But, you know, our goal here is to get you to build something. And when you show it, to an employer, don't say you did it for a class, because by that point, if it's really cool, you'll spend a lot of time on it outside of class, and it'll be yours. But what our goal here is to try to get the people here who are really passionate and excited about technology to do something fun, do something cool, do something that'll sprawl outside the class that you can then uh, use to get a great job. All right, MP4 is out, please get started. I will see you guys on Friday. I have office hours today. Please stop by one to three. Uh, good luck on the homework, good luck on the quiz, good luck on MP4.